Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to webinar brought to you by SBD Automotive and the Automotive Edge Computing Consortium. Today, I'll be talking with Krista Bo Boberg and Roger Berg about coordinating the connected car and network edge so we don't break the internet. My name is Kurt Dusterhoff. I'm with SBD Automotive, and I'll be moderating today's panel. First, uh, before we get started, let's uh, let everybody introduce themselves. Krista, can we start with you, please? Absolutely. Krista Bober, nice to be here. I'm uh, my, my daily work is at the Ericsson CT office and, and uh, generally working with technology strategies within cloud and IoT and specifically focusing on the automotive and connected vehicle industry. I'm also the uh, <clears throat> secretary at the board of ACC and part of the founding uh, members of the Automotive Edge Compute Consortium. Nice to be here. Roger, can we hear a bit about you, please? Sure. I'm Roger Berg. I'm with Denso Corporation. I work in our North American uh, Research and Development Department, uh, focused mainly on uh, connectivity, uh, automated vehicles, and um, associated uh, technologies. Um, I've been at Denso for 20 years. Before that, I was with Sony and Motorola. Uh, doing mainly um, uh, cellular handsets. So I've uh, adapted that know-how to the automotive sector. Uh, Denso is an automotive supplier. So we're interested in how uh, the mobility community can um, work better with the telecommunications uh, community, if you will, um, to uh, facilitate connected vehicles and uh, and uh, mobile edge computing. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so in this discussion, we'll work through a few topics that are going to be covered in an upcoming white paper. Uh, <clears throat> a few key questions helping us to understand how we can prepare um, jointly as automotive and telecoms for a data rich future. So the basic premise behind this conversation is that today's Internet is not ready for tomorrow's connected cars. Um, future automotive workloads are pushing the performance boundaries of what we can do in networks. It's pu pushing boundaries at the network edge and it's pu pushing them potentially to breaking point. So without changing the way we manage vehicle data, without changing the way data moves across the, the network, we really are in the situation where the automotive industry could break the internet by 2030. So with all of that as background, we'll look at a few themes here. One, how we can prioritize and uh, distribute workloads and data transfers to smooth out the uh, network demand. The second, what kind of steps do connected vehicle service architects need to consider to ensure national and global scalability? It's all well and good having a great data rich service, but if we can't scale it to a large uh, market, then it becomes a difficulty. And finally, is there more to enabling global future rich data services beyond fixing the data capacity uh, pinch points? So if we fix those pinch points, what else do we have to do to make this future of uh, data rich automotive uh, industry come about? So before we get started on that, though, <clears throat> we'll have a little poll, see what our audience uh, think about this question of <clears throat> which of these will drive the biggest non-critical data volumes? So we know that there are a lot of automotive services that are going to drive data volumes. Some of those are going to be critical, but we picked a few to look at to get an idea of what the the room is feeling about some of the non-critical data volumes. Will we see things coming from part vehicle security cameras, vehicle and component status, sort of a, a beefed up uh, health report, streaming live data like battery condition? <clears throat> Will we see vehicle software updates driving the data volumes or driving vehicles uplink uh, the video coming from moving vehicles for a variety and range of live video image processing services or perhaps crowdsource mapping? So everybody look at those, see what you think is going to have the biggest influence, what's going to drive that non-critical data volume. Uh, <clears throat> 
so we can just get an idea of who's in the room, what they're worried about, what they think is interesting and exciting, and uh, maybe tailor a bit of uh, the discussion around the use cases you see as most uh, interesting and important. So we've got about half of people who voted. We'll give it another minute or so. <clears throat> when we talk about things like crowdsource mapping, that's not just to where the road is. It also includes what's on the road, traffic, furniture near the road, <clears throat> surface uh, conditions. When we look at driving vehicle video uplink that has any number of uses uh, for the, the live image capture. Vehicle software update is still relatively new in its uh, instantiation. We see that across a select number of ECUs across most manufacturers, but going forwards, perhaps throughout the vehicle on a much higher percentage of vehicles. <clears throat> vehicle and component status, we know that there are governments around the world who are looking at having much more live data coming from vehicles, but also cybersecurity can make benefit from that live data. And of course, <clears throat> Sentry Cam, parked vehicle security cameras, it's uh, great in car parks, but it's also quite handy uh, out front of your house and uh, maybe in the streets. All right, we'll give that another few seconds. We've got a reasonable number of people who've voted. Okay, we'll close that vote and see how it turned out. So there we go. So as you can see, we've got a uh, little more than a third of uh, respondents. So that's than a quarter of the uh, people on the, the webinar today are looking at uh, moving vehicles, driving vehicles, video uplink is the, the key among these use cases for driving non-critical data volumes, followed uh, closely by crowdsource mapping and uh, vehicle software update. <clears throat> I think that's a, a pretty good uh, summary of some of the big use cases. Uh, Roger, what do you think? Are we missing anything there? Or is that a, a good representation of where you see the uh, non-critical data coming from in at least the next uh, five to seven years? Yeah, I think it's a it's a good um, data point, uh, if you will. I do believe that uh, vehicles are being used as you know mobile sensors, and in the case of video uplink, uh, that is one of the ways in which a vehicle could be a sensor. Um, I think in general connectivity is becoming more adept at um, at using these kinds of remote sensing uh, capabilities to, to drive uh, applications. And this is one way I think in which the mobility uh, sector is, is uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe leading the pack in this area. Fantastic. All right, <clears throat> we'll move into the, our themes then and see how, how we catch up with where our audience is. So in terms of uh, co coordinating our data flow, um, We've got a, a quote here from Christer saying that we see the vehicles as, as a sensor, as Roger was saying, um, and that we see big value there as AECC, as an industry, as Ericsson, as all of the different hats you're wearing, uh, Christer. Um, you see big value for endpoints, whether that's business or, or individual consumers. But equally, we've got this problem that data is like electricity. Um, the world doesn't work when it all flows at once. We've got we've got to find a, a way to get it out and back, if you like. Um, so <clears throat> with that in mind, <clears throat> we've got coming up more than 30 million vehicles expected to be sold in 2025, 2026 with forward facing cameras. That's an awful lot of sensor data. And if that were the only sensor that was uploading data, that would be <clears throat> enough in itself. But we know that there are other sensors on the vehicle that are going to be pushing things up. Um, <clears throat> so could you maybe explain more about how the AECC's proofs of concept have, have looked at ways of coordinating that data flow? Sure. Uh, and I think maybe maybe proof of concept before starting with that, I think, you know, I would talk a little bit about the ACC in general and the work we are doing because I think the main work that we have been spending time on is actually to understand how how the you know the the 
what we call the bigger network or the global network really can handle the <clears throat> expected amount of data that that yeah, vehicles will will generate and so everything that we have been doing in ACC when it comes to our advanced white papers defining basically the you know the different services that we are looking at for, from an ACC perspective and I think it was interesting to see that uh, video data maybe not surprised but it, it's good to see though because that's also what we see as the maybe the <clears throat> Yeah, you, you call it non-critical and I can agree, it's maybe what we sometimes call relaxed with relaxed uh, requirements on, on, on latency, etc. compared to some of the more critical. But nevertheless, it's a huge amount of data that need to be sent and, and coordinated. So the technical reports that we have been describing, uh, created describes basically okay, what, what is needed from the network side in order for 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 these data to be sent and in order to to handle uh, you know the edge compute in the network, so that is really where we start. You know, we start with the problem statement of in 2025, 100 new 100 million new vehicles being connected will come will come to the market, and that will 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 create a huge amount of of, of data. Maybe we're a bit earlier depending a little bit, a little bit on, on what's have happened on the geopolitical scene if you say so also uh, with with the pandemic etc but nevertheless there will be a huge amount of data coming from these cars and and again i always emphasize that it's a completely different paradigm from what we saw in uh, in internet uh, so to say in, in what we call from from an Ericsson perspective, the 4G era, now in the 5G era, it's a lot about connected machines, etc. And that is very much generating uplink data coming from the from the vehicle in this case, rather than the opposite. And that is is actually not really handled today. So I think the, the proof of concept uh, for now, it's uh, first of all in a very early stage. And we started this pop hub that you can find on, on, on our website. So the intention of this is to showcase really what have we produced and also what we recommend uh, and to, to show what how will it work in real life to solve a real problem. That is what the proof of concepts do. So in many in many cases then uh, to this, this is a it's a problem of a global industry really meeting a, a local uh, situation or local providers so that is what we say that you know in, in order for this to work we we need to have this global standard we need global deployment because that's the the way for the for the ecosystem and the industry to thrive and really using the networks that we provide so yeah the proof of concept then is is the way we we really demonstrate the current problems and how we solve them and this you know can be a different kind of pot we have a Proof of, concept, uh, proof of concept coming from our members, you know, um, as proposals it could be proof of concept that our working group provides or, or propose, and then members come come up with proposal for how to solve them. And we even work with <clears throat> with external members, not ACC members, together with ACC members to create uh, value. So some that sort of the, the basic work. I, I can talk more about different POCs as well if needed, but uh, yeah. Now, I think it, if we can bring you in, Roger, some of the recent POCs have been looking at how data can be stored locally or transmitted to the cloud depending on time sensitivity. Um, as we say, trying to smooth out that, uh, that data flow that we've been talking about from the polling question and through to here. Um, can you take us through the Cut this more, more some of the specific kinds of problems those are trying to solve and give the viewers some of the highlights of, of what they brought to life in terms of understanding the problems better. Sure. So one of the more recent um, proof of concepts uh, included um, this um, video data being uh, uploaded but on a local basis. So in the case, in the use case that was uh, demonstrated, it was about uh, determining the location of uh, unused parking spots uh, by curbside parking spots. So any car that had a, a dash cam or a, any kind of a camera that was used for, I don't know, lane keep assist or uh, uh, forward uh, crash avoidance 
can be used in, in another uh, way to locate, if it's appropriately trained, to locate where these parking spots are available. Um, a lot of the wasted fuel uh, in ur major urban areas comes from people driving around looking for parking spots. And so if we can have a, a, a feature such as this, where the, the location of open parking spots can be uh, broadcast to people who need, you know, uh, uh, a, a an open parking spot in that particular location. It doesn't matter, you know, two cities down or three blocks away whether there is a parking spot there. But in in the certain region where we would store that data, where it's important from a time and a space perspective, um, we saw. Uh, uh, uh results that um were uh very much um what do i say um cost effective very cost effective in in using that time and space um, utilization um using the edge computing as opposed to sending that data to a cloud um that that covers a whole uh, region a city a country a state a province what have you Thank you. Um, it, it strikes me that if, if we're looking at cases like that, it really is a, trying to balance out what data you're sending various distances from, from the vehicle. You've got mm -hmm. your near vehicle data and your, <clears throat> your more regional or centralized data. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the terms I, I picked up when I was reading that white paper was opportunistic uh, data transfer, looking to transfer the, the right data at the right time, the right distance away from the vehicle. Is that something uh, <clears throat> you'd be able to give us a bit more information about? You know, shall I take that, Roger, sure. start with, or do you, yeah, I can start and then you fill in. No, but I think this is one really interesting proof of concept, one of the first that we, that we did. And it's about, uh, as you say, it's part of the technical report starting to say that data coming from the car as, as Roger also said I mean it's a sensor with various different uh, type of, of, of data requirements and not all that data is is real-time critical or maybe even <clears throat> of ve quite various different type of, of, of uh, uh, value and, and, and needs for, for speed so to say in the, to bring to the cloud or to the edge so that's the main topic of that uh, uh, proof of cost to show really that there are mechanisms in in that can be brought into the car that can be brought into the network to to what we say categorize or prioritize the traffic differently in order to to decide if this needs to be sent now or if you can wait or you know that is the main thing for that uh, case and I think that is really really important going forward that that uh, in order to utilize networks and clouds in a better way that you actually are are quite clear on 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 those requirements so you, so that you can separate from uh yeah data that has, has higher re requirement and, and needs rather from than than data that is uh, yeah not as as critical and that is also uh, something we talk about in the in the first white paper that it's a question also about cost and availability right so you need to be able to to separate on that. Rod, you you yeah, sorry. That's, sorry, you mentioned requirements, um, and <clears throat> Roger, as, as you talk about this, uh, <clears throat> are you developing requirements through these POCs? Are you are you proving out specifications? Are you refining them? Uh, what what's coming out of them that uh, the wider industry can can benefit from? It's a little bit of all of that, Kurt. Actually. So our process in AECC, it goes from uh, use case requirements development all the way toward to the uh, idea of Im implementation so that we can show that our designs and the, that the use case is valid, first of all, and that the design or the architecture for complying with the use case requirements can actually be met in a, in a physical implementation. I think that's important that we do that whole cycle um because oftentimes you know we, we might have a draw up a use case and we might draw up some requirements but the feasibility of those requirements being met and the impact that that has on the 
usability of the use case or the application um, really uh, bears out when when you actually do your uh, your demonstration. And a lot of times, that that demonstration, the results of the test testing or the implementation or the demonstration, really come back to the original uh, use case and re further refine the requirements or further refine the implementation or the architecture used to comply with those requirements um, from the real world data. So I think that is a very valuable cycle in in uh, making our use cases, our business proposals, our applications um, much more appealing from a from a, a business and a technical perspective when we can update uh, everything from the you know the use case definition to those requirements to the implementation or the architecture and then the implementation to show that these are really valuable uh, assets for the industry um, in that we can show valuable use cases and uh, solutions that actually meet the requirements of those use cases. Cool. And I, I think that one of the virtues of some of these is bringing together <clears throat> both the uh, generator and consumer of that data and its, its main pathways. And I know that there's some cloud uh, providers also in the group that so you've got that full range of, of ecosystem mm -hmm. presented, which is yeah, it, yeah for, for those kinds of for those kinds of uh, applications, it's not one company can't do all of it, or even one industry can't do all of it. So that's why I think this kind of community collaboration that we have in AECC is really valuable in 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 proving that number one, there are um, useful applications and useful use cases, useful user stories. They are uh, commercially viable when we show the demonstration, and then we can use that as examples for how the industry can uh, collaborate to to actually, you know, build new uses for either networks or the the, the vehicles or the, the transportation or mobility system in 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 and of itself or as a as a whole. Thank you. So <clears throat> we've got. This idea that we we're understanding that we need to manage our data flow and coordinate automotive with uh, telecommunications endpoints with infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so if we we've, we've got that moving, um, <clears throat> as as you said, Christopher, we haven't gotten yet to the state of uh, hundreds of millions of connected vehicles. Um, quote there from another AECC board member, uh, Saeed Tabet. We know it's going to happen and it's not going to happen in the distant future it's going to happen in the next few years that our, our global connected vehicle uh, landscape is in the hundreds of millions so <clears throat> if we've got all these data rich services like finding parking spaces like <clears throat> processing to video to find out where the bumps in the roads are the potholes like mapping road uh, furniture as, as we go and developing crowdsourced maps, like having global pan vehicle software updates. That's a lot of data that's processed locally and it scales differently to the way we process things centrally, um, collecting it lo locally. Can we actually, as a com combination of industries, can we scale or do we have to do something different? Yeah. Right. No, I think the, the the paradigm or the 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 concept of what we say the 991 or 90 percent uh, nine and one percent we have been talking about that for a while. I think it's a, it's a relative figure, of course, but it repre represents the importance of what you call scaling and balancing data transport and compute, right? So I think uh, the the thing is really. Before we talk about, uh, you know, can we handle all this data that the, the car generate? Absolutely not. There is no way that that you, you send all that data to central cloud and see what happens, right? So you need to decide really about wh where to handle what data, what is important where. And I think this is all about edge computing in general, right? Or distributed computing, if you want to say so. I mean, there <clears throat> there is a there is a process to decide where do you place the data what case and that will also differ so it's not like one size fits all that you always have to to put data here so when we 
think also that was stated in one of our first white paper that you know data need to be where it belongs and it's either very close to the producer or to the consumer or somewhere in between depending on who is the consumer so to say so we we generally say that you know data can be offloaded to to re, you know re, reduce compute in the car it can be and that you Rod, you can talk more about that you know what 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 limits you have in the car like uh, yeah buffers or compute tech etc but uh, but the, the, i think the main thing also then that's one thing right you you need to to compute it in the car but you can also localize it what we call in acc the localized network right we, we talk about that a lot that basically you manage data for a certain area or for certain uh, collections of car or certain types of car etc so so basically first of all to say that 90 percent of the data will never leave the car because it's only for the car or it's of no use and you need to decide that as early as possible maybe you can't, cannot decide that maybe the car cannot decide that that's only for 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 the car or for that car or or it's not of you so you need to send data somewhere to decide if 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 that data should be used and that's what we call the 10 percent or the, the 10 number 10 there and that need to be analyzed as early as possible and that's what we typically put at the at the edge and and uh, that data is analyzed and perhaps uh, distribute further to to other vehicles or other entities in the network and that that's by the way another concept the proof of concept that we showed very early at, at the mobile board congress as part of of, of uh, uh, the acc uh, statement back then and the one percent of say is the data that is crucial to keep or to to use and be stored what we saw what we computed centrally so generally uh, data shall be filtered as early as possible and then you need to decide that even if that happens how do we how do we handle uh, the amount of data well edge computing is one of the of the uh, natural cases that we have been bringing in because we saw uh, before we started acc that, that that you know edge compute was it was talked about a lot but there were no means really for the industry to use it in a, in a in a yeah consistent way so if you can do that in a consistent and, and uh, cost-effective way, there is a, a lot to, to, to save when it comes to transport, compute, etc., in order to handle the data that is needed. So that is one main thing we try to focus on in ACC. You mentioned a 99-1 concept, so 90% of the data stays in the car, processed in the car, either aggregated or compressed or whatever. In terms of volume, nine percent happens. Something happens with that data near the vehicle, as you say, in a local network infrastructure, and then one percent goes centrally. Now, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that's not how a lot of things are happening now. If we take it away from critical data, where everything has to be calculated in the car because you have to be able to ensure that it's uh, it's driving safely. Um, <clears throat> but if we if we take that forward at scale, Roger. <clears throat> What does that mean for in-vehicle architecture and components? Do we have to do something different as automotive uh, engineers to make sure that the hardware can cope with the 90% of the, the data that, uh, that Chris is saying, maybe we don't need that to go onto the networks, maybe we don't, or we certainly don't need it all to go to a centralized cloud because most of it's not relevant to a global fleet. Um, <clears throat> what's the impact on cars of, of that sort of concept and how can we think about that uh, in a way that scales to the future. Well, the uh, the distribution of that compute and storage uh, um, configuration, I guess, is still a, a relevant uh, research topic. I think a lot of it, a lot of the needs depend on how the how the use case is defined. Um, sometimes you you can do uh, all your computing on your vehicle. Sometimes you need you know. Uh, computing that isn't doesn't exist in your vehicle system because it's an older vehicle or it it doesn't have the capacity to 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 compute or store um, uh, relevant data in order to to comply with the requirements of the use case and so sometimes we have to go off board 
to get those resources that enable those services on a, an, you know, a, a, a vehicle with limited uh, compute capability. Now, when we start to talk about uh, uh, safety, um, safety systems, like uh, um, advanced, you know, safety systems in, in, that are in becoming more prevalent, sorry, in vehicles these days, we start to add a little bit more of that compute power. And therefore, those kinds of vehicles that have those architectures that allow for, you know, ADAS processing, maybe have some, uh, some capability or some ability to use that processing capability for some of these uh, you know, uh, distributed data um, use cases that we're talking about, but not all the time. And so that's when we have to think about where that compute and storage is actually located and how it's um, more uh, cost effective. If you put all kinds of compute power just in every every vehicle, then um, you know the cost is is big for the vehicle manufacturer. If you can offload some of that computer data storage to it, it, the edge or the infrastructure or you know some of that data that's necessary or that compute power that's necessary for a particular region or a point in space and time, then that's um, more cost effective to be uh, distributed in the infrastructure rather than in every single uh, vehicle. So it really depends on the requirements of the use case at hand and where that compute and storage um, is optimized from a from a cost and a usage perspective. Okay, so it seems to me it's kind of analogous to the problem telematics faced maybe seven, eight years ago where <clears throat> every byte seemed to cost an absolute bomb to an OEM. And so that sort of opportunistic data transfer then was, well, we'll aggregate all of the data we would have sent over the course of the day and maybe send it every other day. Mm -hmm. And so it required a little bit of a memory boost in the car, some reasonable processing. Things happened after shutdown, so we had longer shutdown times for maybe an extra three minutes trying to mm -hmm. package stuff up and, and deal with it <clears throat> away from the drive cycle, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Is it safe to say that this 991 concept actually goes into the car as well, where we're looking at there's an awful lot of data in the future vehicle with its GPUs, with sensor data from all around the car, full 360 degree camera, LIDAR, radar, sonar, <coughs> in vehicle cameras, and all the good stuff that we're putting into cars for some really cool use cases. Is it safe to say that that sort of 991 concept also applies in car? That 90% of the data we're probably just going to use once in bin. 9%, 10% is that sort of, this may be of benefit outside this ECU to other pieces of the car. And then that little tiny nugget is actually worth sending up into the uh, the edge of the cloud for for consumption away from the vehicle. Or are we, do we have an analogous situation in the car of trying to do our own scaling before we even start to look outside the car, do you think? Um, to a certain extent, and, and like I said, it depends on really on the use case that you're talking about. Uh, some use case might follow that 99 and 1 percent uh, partitioning. Another use case might need 50, 40, 10, or another use case might need 20, 80. You know, it it really depends on the computation and storage uh, requirements for to deliver a certain uh, use case. Cool. Do you have any thoughts on that, Christian, before I jump on to the next poll? And yes, we do have some questions coming in. We'll, we will have yeah. a Q&A time at the end. I think, I think I, I mean, Roger is the expert on the in-car, of course, I will not uh, question that. And and I, but I think you're right in general. I think it's very use case specific, as I said from the beginning, that 991 is just a thinking, right? That you, you should try to filter out as much data as possible when you can. If you don't have the mechanism, you know, to do the filtering at the edge, I mean, you need to send it to the central cloud and that will be costly and ineffective. And if you cannot put the mechanism, you know, what we call analytics at the edge, for instance, to actually analyze and maybe steer what data in more real time, what the, what the car shall send. I mean, 
you should avoid sending duplicates, but the car doesn't know if it's a duplicate or not. If you can steer that to happen, you can save a lot. So I think it's completely right, but it depends what type of data there is. So, yes. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. So before we crack on to the third topic, uh, wake everybody up, let, let's ask you another question. Um, <clears throat> let's assume that we get our data scaling and our data transfer coordinated and that we've got an, a good idea as two working together industries about how to have a, a smoother data path from vehicle through the network into the, the local and regional and global places it wants to, to go. So that's a, assuming that we get there, what's the next big hurdle to the automotive and uh, telecoms industries providing services supported at the network edge? So, services where the network edge is supporting, it's a key support piece to those service. What are some of the big hurdles that we've got to fix? Otherwise known as what's next on the list after we get all of that right? Um, are we looking at service uniformity across the market, being able to offer the same service in every city, every major city or every state or region of a country, um, every country in Europe, for example? Are we looking at the sorting out the service uniformity across segments so that we can offer the same sort of segments uh, services in a and b and c and g segment vehicles maybe some using local networks some using uh, in vehicle compute are we looking at an automated adaptive data flow versus processing versus transmission cost calculation so that we know <clears throat> fairly easily when we need to be doing something in the car at the edge maybe something somewhere more regional or, or centrally and doing that adapting auto automatically to when we need to send or store data um, to best smooth out that path or are we looking at maybe at finding the right use cases for fleet applications finding the things that uh, are not just looking at uh, consumer interest but uh, looking at those big oem or logistics fleets that run vehicles around uh, our major markets, major rental companies, major delivery companies. <clears throat> Where do we think we need to head next? We've got a, a, a few people have voted. We'll give it another minute uh, for anybody else who's uh, still keeping track of where we are and <clears throat> give them a chance to, to vote. And I think before I I'll close that vote in just another 10 seconds or so. And then before I open it up to uh, show the results, I'm going to ask uh, our panelists the same question. Um, <clears throat> if these are your four, still have a few people voting before I put it to you. Roger, you and Christopher can think about this and see which one you think the room is going to go with um, rather than which one you feel. Let's, let's see if, if you can guess. So. What everybody else is saying and we'll close that now oh, wait we've had a whole lot of people wake up and we'll give them another five seconds all right we'll give that a close so uh Christer, where do you think the room landed yeah i was thinking myself about them and i think <laughs> all of them are are important right. i would say Right. I would say it's very similar to, on all of them. I I think that uh, yeah, that's tricky. I think maybe that that uh, the one of the two last could be what the what the crowd is thinking about. I'm more into the two first, but I think maybe that <laughs> at the end is I think about the two two last ones perhaps. Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Roger? Where do you think the room might have landed? uh it's hard for me to say i think all i right. agree with Christopher that all, all of them are important and all of them are uh, challenges at the present time i think um one thing that's that's valuable is that i i think as we move through uh 5g 5g advance and into 6g a lot of the market the different uh, market segments are all after the same thing and i think that's going to be beneficial for um from a from a commercial perspective as well as from a you know just service availability perspective but i think you're gonna 
you're going to need as a as a cellular service provider or connectivity provider or a transportation mobility provider, you're going to need to have the same uh, characteristics and same same uh, capabilities um, no matter where you are or no matter who's your uh, target market. And so I think that that will play a big role in achieving some of these objectives and meeting some of the requirements on a wide range of use cases, not just for mobility, but for other um, you know, vertical markets where connectivity is important. All righty. Thank you. Let's see where the room landed then. <clears throat> Right. I think we have a lot of network people and people who are interested in costs on today. Um, so half of the uh, respondents are looking at uh, adaptive data flow processing and transmission cost balancing. So you're know, trying to get that that balance to happen automatically, adapting to what else is going on in the network. And it's a fascinating problem. Um, one that we could spend hours, I'm sure, talking about and enjoying uh, trying to find good ways of making that happen. And then we've got uh, the other three fairly <coughs> uniform, looking at service uniformity across the market and across segments. And then if we think of it as a, a segment of its own, finding the right use cases for fleet applications. As you say, Krista, they're all big hurdles ahead of us. Um, it's a case of trying to figure out which ones people are most concerned about uh, and which ones they think are in their way of getting where they need to on their own development. Uh, and maybe where they're able to contribute to, to the story. Um, and that well, maybe you're something. happy to see that uh, number three. It was interesting because then you see the value of, of what we talked about also be, the, our first proof of concept. You know, to to have a, a differentiation in in managing the traffic flow. So happy to see that. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so in that theme of where to from here, we've got a couple of points that are mildly related but they impact where we go from here it's the discussion currently going on in europe about uh, trying to change the way or increase the number of large companies investing at the outset for um, telecommunications network and the point that well we've come across as automotive industry for more than a decade now that nobody really wants to pay for internet infrastructure and when i say nobody i'm that's there's Nobody's ending up saying, I really want to spend all my money on this um, because we all know it's hard to get your money back. It takes a lot of time. And so <clears throat> if we want to change that from nobody to somebody, we have to come up with some, some appealing services, some appealing uh, benefits to multiple markets so that that nobody changes to somebody or in some case anybody. Um, I'm not going to go into who that should be. The question is more around where do we think we can go to bring those appealing services that actually make it interesting for somebody at the end point? We all know that the end point in the food chain always ends up paying for whatever service. How do we make that, that payment appealing to people? What kinds of things do you think we can be offering? Um, Roger, I'll, I'll throw that one at you first and Thanks. let you run with it for a bit. I kind of tried to touch on this um, concept a little bit um, previously that I think there's uh, multiple sectors that are actually uh, trying to address user requirements that are uh, similar um, for different vertical markets or different use cases and I think that that will drive the investment in that you know in, in order to meet some of these uh, use case requirements the investment will will be necessary but it will be useful in more than one sector. It's not like mobility will fund the, you know, building of, uh, you know, 5G advanced uh, infrastructure, or that the, you know, metaverse will be the only one contributing to, you know, the, the needs of the of the new um, connectivity um, uh, requirements. I think. Or, or medical, or you know, whatever industry you wanted to start to talk about. I think that um, what I'm seeing is that they're all driving towards many of the same requirements, and that will um, will prove to be a better investment for the uh, equipment uh, manufacturers and the uh, cellular or connectivity service suppliers. What 
what do you think uh, we need to be doing, Krista, to to increase the number of companies, industries, people who are willing to help uh, foot the bill for the infrastructure that's going to deliver these services? Where do you think? Uh, Let's try to keep it to, to connected automotive. What do you, where do you think you can see from your experience today in AECC some benefits coming out that might be appealing? Yeah, and, and looking at this question and thinking about I, 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 it's a very very advanced question if you look at it from a from a you know society perspective, right? Because this is all about the the future internet and how it will you know look like and who is paying for it and. As we say, there's nothing as a free lunch, right? There's someone need to pay it, uh, and and uh, <laughs> in the end, it's always the the what we call the end user, the consumer that is using the service that is paying for it. But it could be in different ways. And I think you're absolutely right that we, when we look at the next uh, <clears throat> future services, there will be a need for a, what we call a network densification, network build out, etc. And maybe that's even more. Uh, uh, apparent when you look at the mobility industry or the connected vehicle industry because it's moving around not only in populated areas so there's a different paradigm of, of that but i think coming back to more of uh, services first of all i think we should go back a bit to the what we stated before what roger and we were talking about that that the vehicle is this fantastic sensor right it's a what we can call a crowdsourced advanced sensor. I mean, a smartphone is also sensor, but has huge limitations to, compared to what you have in the car. So I think there will be a lot of data. I mean, data in general is is, is the key for this. And I think that, that uh, <clears throat> having data generated, using that for different kind of purposes, that will be absolutely uh, needed. Exactly what for, I cannot tell, and that's not, not my business, I would say, but from a, if you say network vendor from Ericsson perspective, we absolutely see that that densification of networks is necessary. I think, though, that uh, the biggest paradigm happening now is obviously XR and metaverse in general, right? And that uh, it's interesting because if you look at the, those use cases, very much very similar to what what the ECC started to talk about 2017. For the automotive industry, so I, I absolutely be believe that that the, the 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 things that that will be paid for in one or another way uh, by by different actors will relate to to the the XR space, let's say, and that will be broader and bigger than the automotive industry. But mm. I also believe that automotive industry and connected vehicle will be a big part of that paradigm for sure. So. In, in many ways, the, the vehicle is providing <clears throat> non-specific data. If I keep it away from what people often think about data privacy, about you know my credit card details, all of that, it's providing data about the environment around it, which effectively is feeding the ability of a digital twin of a city to always have live data. It's feeding the representation of what's going on in a city or, so that we've got a digital representation of traffic flows, of dense traffic density, of you know, what types of vehicles are on the road. So are we looking at heavy logistics usage at this time of day, um, crash collection at that time of day, <clears throat> passenger car traffic at a different time of day, and building up that environmental context picture uh, around the vehicles using the car as that sensor. And <clears throat> so consumers of that kind of data whether it's for creating a game about uh, what's going on live in New York or actually providing some sort of useful uh, digital service based on that data. That's that's where you're seeing the, the sort of confluence between the mass data flows for these non-critical types of features we were talking about and the data consumption for additional services. I, I would say so, and that's why why I say it also is that that is where ACC is focusing. That's why we started ACC, Automotive Edge Compute. We were even discussing when we started it to call it something else, like Automotive Big Data. So it's all about you know how we how we handle that and and categorize different different uh, you know uh, importance of that data. But I, I I do believe that that's where the the biggest sort of new type of of services will reside. Then obviously there will be a lot of other 
things coming from the automotive side, but but I let the experts <laughs> in the connected <laughs> vehicle decide what services they 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 can get paid for. If I put it like that. Yep. Fair enough. Um, we've got about ten minutes going. I'm do a quick wrap up of where we've been and open up the floor to questions. We've got a few coming, and hopefully a few more will join uh, <clears throat> the the queue that I can work through. So essentially, we we started off looking at can we scale all of the services and data flows that we know we want to with the vehicle as a sensor, um, with the way the internet is built today, which is downlink heavy. Um, and the answer is no. We need to do something different. We need to do more in or near the car than rather than just pump everything off to a centralized cloud because the internet, if we do that, will break. Um, <clears throat> we moved into a few different areas around. <clears throat> what that means in terms of actually making that data smoothing and data flow control happen, where things happen, making sure that uh, processing and uh, data flow are relevant to the places they go in terms of distance from the car. And then <clears throat> the, we brought that back, Chris, into, and once we've got all of that, the right data, the most relevant data that's not just relevant to the car itself, that's relevant to an outside world of some type, that's really where we're expecting to see the interest from the outside world in what the automotive, uh, the connected automotive industry is providing in terms of that data for wider consumption. Um, so it's a nice little neat package. I, I, I'll be honest, that's, I wasn't sure where we'd end up from this question, so it's nice that it's rounded back to the start. Um, with that in mind, I'll start working through the questions. And the first one is, how can the industry create handle creating a standard set of software components, data definitions, interfaces at the edge, while also coping with the different edge implementations, different and fragments of privacy regulations across different countries and regions. Um, <clears throat> what's the ACC's uh, position and role in helping the, its contributors and, and members navigate, well, what can only be described as a spider web there, of different uh, requirements and, uh, and industrial uh, approaches yeah do you want to start roger maybe i'll take a swipe at it i think that's really one of the reasons why aecc was created it's to get people who have these different sets of expertise together to see what you know what's what the state of the industry is and what the capabilities will be in the future in the near future and and show that they can be uh, implemented and demonstrated um, now uh, to to sort of set the stage for uh, you know commercial deployments eventually um, as i mentioned before i don't i don't think there's any one company or any even one industry that could satisfy all the needs of what the community like aecc provides um, and 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 sets up our kind of a, a vision of our future in what kind of uh, use cases will be addressed or what what we will focus on how the architecture will be put together to uh i don't know, give a flexible array or a flexible configuration of compute and communication in order to solve uh, some of the you know use case requirements that we talked about <clears throat> Yeah, and maybe just adding, I, I, I completely agree, of course. I think that also um, a <clears throat> lot of the work actually has not been to, to find new things. It has to be to point to things that exist and standards that exist and say that and the plethora of things that has been standardized, this is the best, the blueprint, so to say, for this use case to work in the best way. This is what auto manufacturers, network vendors, telecom operators, cloud and edge providers, application providers should should ap apply and comply to. And, and that's sort of the, the main reason. But yes, there are, it's a good question. I think that, that there are pieces that are easier to standardize that, that have more of what we call a multi-vendor, multi-actor approach than others in this space, obviously. And uh, but we are we are trying as much as possible to work in what we call an open ecosystem open and multi-vendor fashion so to say that you know anyone that want to comply should and can follow these principles 
and then it's up to to uh, I think the industry in each segment to 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 do that, right? Thank you. Um, we've got a little bit more interest in hearing about uh, one or two of the proofs of concept, um, and we talked about the one for finding parking spaces on the road. Are there any others that you would want to highlight that that show real world examples of computing as near the vehicle as possible and only as near the vehicle as possible to, to understand that the processing data, not just locally, but at the right time of day, at the, at the, in the right sequence uh, for, for, for smoothing for data. I don't know if you wanted to pick up with that one, Roger. You know, I, I think Christopher mentioned this about opportunistic data transfer, um, where whereas you know the 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 age or the uh, latency of the data is not so critical to uh, uh, to a use case or to a you know a, a particular event in a particular point in time and space that we can use um, capacity that's that's not totally utilized uh, like overnight or I think the use case talked about uh, sending um, map data uh, 3D, um, you know, 3D map data uh, um, over over the the non-congested uh, network at, at nighttime, as opposed to having you know it having it there uh, at, during you know travel hours. Uh, I think that is a uh, one example of the you know uh, conceptually looking at those. Uh, data and uh, data storage and data computation resources that are available to optimize their use uh, depending on the, the way the network is configured and your use case, the particular needs of your use case. Okay. Um, <clears throat> speaking of scheduling, um, questions come through. How can we schedule resources at the edge when we're driving at pace, which means we may be handing over every few seconds, every few minutes, how, how does that get optimized? Uh, maybe, Chris, you can give us a few it's points a on how question. that works. Yeah, and I actually, we have done a proof of concept. It's actually not on the PocHub, I think, but we showed it in MWC, I don't remember, 20 before pandemic, where we actually, I think it was, <clears throat> yeah, I don't exactly remember the company names, but uh, it was actually showing exactly that. How do you handle mobility? in a case where a car drives at a certain speed over multiple what you call um, packet gateways in the, in the network and edge instances and that that POC showed two things from edge white paper or technical report it's what we call the edge data offloading and the, uh, what was the other name Roger of the of the function edge data offloading and yeah edge site selection I think it's like where how do you find the, the the user plane or the packet gate or UPF and how do you hand over to the right instance of the uh, of the edge uh, instance for the application because it will be different depending on the place so that is what's shown there I think uh, that can be found uh, maybe on the POC or or at the internet so that's one of the cases we actually have in the TR and in the POC. Cool. We've got about thirty seconds to go, so I'm going to ask you a quick question and ask for a yet a simple yes no. Um, we have a question, do you see a lot of these POCs can be done using a cell phone as an edge device rather than an, a network infrastructure device? So you've got a, a cell phone in the car, it's got a lot of compute. Could you see that as an extra compute node to, to help out on some of these use cases? Yes. <laughs> yes, cloud everywhere. Fantastic. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone who stayed on to listen through the entire uh, webinar. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. I certainly have. Um, the AECC will be following up with uh, a link to the white paper to download, I believe, early next week. So enjoy your weekends when they come. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.